Hey everyone, thanks for joining Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Bernholtz. I am an anesthesia and an ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, on behalf of the EMS office, Director Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, thanks for what you guys do every day. Thanks for your dedication to lifelong learning. A uh, big shout out to Ashley Brooks, who is one of our uh, young members and volunteers at Pikesville, who is running our IT support tonight. Uh, Ashley will be putting a link in the chat sometime during this training. Um, you can click on that link, give us a couple pieces of information, and you can get your CEUs. If you want your CEUs, keep an eye out on the chat box sometime in the middle, and we'll announce it. Ashley will be putting a link into that box uh, for your CEUs. So tonight we have Karen Gonzalez and Amy Miles. Uh, Karen is a stroke coordinator at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center and stroke certified registered nurse since 2015. She, uh, prior to that, she cared for stroke patients in the stroke unit at St. Joe's. Amy Miles has been an emergency department nurse since 2004. She currently works as an ED charge nurse and serves as an EMS liaison at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center. You guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule for sharing your lessons learned and your uh, helping to educate our frontline staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I'm Karen. And... All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, so Amy and I are here to talk to you about Stroke 101, what you need to know about stroke and stroke education and uh, what we depend on you guys to do to help us get the care to our patients. Well, look at that. All right, hang on a second, guys. All right, there we go. My cursor wasn't working. All right, so as you know, time is brain. I think you guys have all heard that. That's been around for a really long time and that is really meaningful. So a couple of things we wanna talk about is strikes, stroke um, strikes about 795,000 people a year in the United States alone. It's about equal or a little bit more than heart attacks. So most people think of heart attacks, but strokes are just as prevalent. About every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke people die from stroke. It is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And it's the number one cause of preventable disability. And so that's where you guys come in. If we get the patients to us quickly, we recognize the symptoms, give them quickly, we can prevent that long-term disability. So what can we do for them? Because if we ask you to get them quick, what are our choices? We can give them all to place, also known as TPA. And that's from zero to four and a half hours from the last time, last known well time. That's really important. You're going to hear me say that again. The other thing is an endovascular clot retrieval or a mechanical thrombectomy where they actually go up with a catheter through the groin um, and into the brain to take that clot out. So it has their parameters, going to be a certain, in a certain vessel. Um, it has to be zero to 24 hours from the last known well time. So when we think about stroke centers, we know we're not all stroke centers are created equally. We work at St. Joe's. St. Joe's is a primary stroke center. And what that means is we follow, we have evidence-based care, standardized care. We use stroke orders. Um, we, we follow the guidelines from AHA and ASA. We follow the COMAR from the state of Maryland. Um, and we are MIMS designated. So we've been designated as a stroke center uh, and we're up for our next redesignation next year. There's also comprehensive stroke centers. So those are like University of Maryland, Hopkins and Bayview. Those centers take care of the subarachnoid hemorrhages, the medium to large ICH patients. Um, if we have a stroke that's a large stroke and we're worried about there being edema that's gonna press in the brain and cause brainstem injury, we send those to those patients and they do that mechanical thrombectomy, the endovascular treatment. That to be a comprehensive stroke center, you have to have 24 seven um, neurosurgery, endovascular th therapy and neuro ICU. The next level, which isn't listed here is a mechanical thrombectomy, thrombectomy capable stroke center. 
that's Sinai. They don't have the 24 seven that, that um, Hopkins and Bayview and University of Maryland have, but they can do mechanical thrombectomy. So that's the difference there. So we know that when the brain doesn't get the blood that they want, that causes tissue death. It's a medical emergency. So either in a stroke, either there's a clot so the blood can't get through or there's a, a rupture and the blood gets everywhere. Neither one's good. So ischemic stroke is like that clogged pipe. Hemorrhagic stroke is a leaky pipe. The brain doesn't like either one of those situations. Here's another look at the ischemic versus the hemorrhagic. And we know that ischemic strokes account for about 87% of strokes. Um, so there's the see a lot of old people with those, um, but that is the prevalence. 13% are hemorrhagic strokes. However, people don't live as long with hemorrhagic strokes and some people die suddenly from hemorrhagic strokes. Those people tend to decompensate very quickly in the emergency department. So within the hemorrhagic stroke, we think of intracerebral hemorrhage, which is the blood vessel bursting into the brain tissue itself or the subarachnoid, which happens near the blood vessel surface of the brain. Um, both are bad. So normally, this is where I would ask for feedback from you guys, and it's hard to do this virtually, but I'd ask you, do you know the difference between a transient ischemic stroke and a stroke? So think about that. Um, it really, when, the per when you're seeing that patient, they come in, they have the same BFAS symptoms. So it looks the same, right? Um, and you don't know if it's gonna be a long-term effect or not because the difference between a TIA and a stroke is a TIA is temporary and a stroke leaves permanent damage. So we like to think of TIAs as those uh, warning signs or the maxi event, kind of like the end stemming to the STEMI. It's a symptom that something bigger could happen and we need to take them seriously because we do know that 15% of all strokes occur after a TIA. So causes of stroke, we know it can be a thrombosis in the large arteries, think the carotid arteries of, in your neck um, and going the MCA going up into the, the brain um, and the small arteries, the, the lacunars. So those are caused by hypertension, the lacunars. Um, it can also be things like plaque that breaks off and travels as an embolism. So people that have atherosclerosis, that can cause a stroke. Um, we also know that AFib, it makes people prone to close clots and those are cardioembolic strokes, congestive heart failure as prone to strokes, as well as sepsis. So what is our goal? So this picture shows um, two areas that we really are gonna look at a lot. This is the core. That's the part of the tissue that's infarcted. We're not gonna get that back. That has permanent damage to it. This part here that's darker than the other blue, this is called the penumbra. This is the area that if we can stop the stroke in its progress, um, we can save. But if we can't stop the stroke, the damage could potentially go all the way out here and cause that lifelong disability. So that's where we come to say time is brain because the quicker we can get there, the quicker we can stop that. So it's always good to know your own personal risk factors and those of people around you. So this is kind of an education. It's not just for the patient you're taking care of, but just in general. There are things people can't change about their risk factors. One is their age, their gender, their genetics, and whether they've had a stroke before or a TIA. Things that we do encourage people to work on, their blood pressure, their diabetes. Um, if you have dyslipidemia, you want to take your statin drug. AFib, you want to be on anticoagulation. Sleep apnea, you need to wear the CPAP. Obesity, we want to do behavior modification as far as exercise and diet. We want to stop smoking, drug abuse, illicit, illicit drug use and alcohol abuse. All those can cause be risk factors for stroke. And um, the last statistic on the bottom is from the American Heart Association, that up to 80% of all strokes can be prevented by controlling your risk factors. So that's a really important take home point. Um, common symptoms of stroke, which I'm sure you all know, but we put this slide in here anyway. Um, that one side weakness, it could be the entire side or just one arm or leg, um, a facial droop, a sensory change, um, a language chase. There's aphasia where they can't get the word out. That would be expressive aphasia. And there's accept, uh, receptive aphasia where they can't understand what you're saying to them. There is dysarthria, dysarthria which is um, tongue 
tongue bro- problem and slur speech. I'm sorry, there's like background noise. It's really distracting in my house right now. Um, visual disturbances. Um, that's where you can't see out of one quarter of your eye. That would be that, that visual disturbance. Um, it could be, you can't see the left side of both eyes, the right side of both eyes, um, or a blurred vision. Gait disturbance. They can't walk a straight line. They feel like they're drunk. Um, decline in consciousness. We see that in the brainstem. Dizziness. Um, they feel really dizzy, like the room is spinning. Could it be vertigo? It could, but we don't know. That sudden severe headache with no known cause. That thunderclap headache. Worst headache of my life. If any of these sun- symptoms come up sudden, abrupt, or rapid, we want to say that we're going to work them up as a stroke. And what's really important, because we know about the treatment window, is we need to know when was the last time they were normal? When was the last time they were known well? Because we're going to start from that clock and push out four and a half hours for the TPA or push out 24 hours for endovascular therapy. So that's really important to know. So other symptoms of stroke, respiratory abnormalities, we see those in those brainstem strokes, difficulty swallowing, that's a cranial nerve deficit, nausea and vomiting, we'll see those in a cerebellar stroke. Um, neglect, that's where they don't even recognize the side of their body. They might start walking into things. Vertigo, tinnitus, the ringing in the ears. Um, bilateral weakness, we see that with a brainstem stroke a lot of times where they might have both arms are weak or numb. Not your usual presentation. We also know that there are stroke mimics. So that's listed here and I won't go through all of them, but basically if your patient comes to you or you get called for a patient that has stroke symptoms, are you gonna to try to figure out the field if it's a stroke mimic or you're gonna bring them to the hospital? I want you to say you're gonna bring them to the hospital because we'll figure this out when they get here, right? We wanna make sure we're getting them quick so we can treat them. We don't want you to figure that out in the field. So now it's time for a quiz. So we'll just read this and we'll see. I want you guys to think to yourself when you're reading this. You get on the scene and this is what you find. A 65-year-old woman who's confused but can respond to your questions. She can move her right arm and leg slightly, but with great difficulty. She finds pulsating and throbbing pain on one side of her head. Her speech is slurred. Her mouth is dry. And all the symptoms happened in the last half hour. So sudden onset. So think to yourself when you're looking at that, what do you think were the stroke symptoms that you would, would, you would think, oh, I better make this a priority rolling call because this looks like it's a stroke. So normally I would have you guys tell me. Well, it's hard for you to tell me now. So I will just, cause you, there's like 30 some of you on the call. So here the, here's the answer. She had difficulty moving her right side. She had a sudden onset of a headache, slurred speech. Do you remember what we said the last known well was? happened within 30 minutes. So if it's two o'clock, it happened in 30 minutes, we're gonna say the last time well was 1.30. We, it could have been 1.40, but they said last 30. So we're gonna push out because we wanna make that window as accurate as possible. And you wanna get the contact information from the family member or a friend. So we can ask them, what is their history? What medications are they taking? So we can follow up with that. So now this is the part you guys play as well. We're gonna talk about the chain of survival for stroke care. It's called the D's of stroke care. So we're gonna look at each one of these. So we wanna have rapid recognition of the stroke symptoms, that's the detection. So that really first starts out with the patient or their family or their friends or whoever happens to be around them in the mall and sees it, look, this person looks like they're having a stroke and what do they do? They're gonna call you guys. And they're gonna detect this by using Be Fast. Um, so we wanna look for it fast. Well, we use Be Fast at St. Joe's. American Heart uses FAST, which is based on the Cincinnati scale. We add the B and the E to pick up those posterior stroke symptoms. So B is for balance or headache and dizziness. E is for the eyes, the blurred vision or that loss of vision. F is for face, which is sometimes hard to tell. If you have them smile, you can always see part of their teeth. That's a good check. Arm or leg weakness, speech we talked about, and it's time for them to call you. And then you're going to call them in as a priority one. So when they call you, EMS, they call 911, they're gonna activate and call you guys to have you go to see the patient and assess their stroke symptoms. Um, You're gonna identify them, manage them and transport them. And then you're gonna find out what was their last known well time. So something you wanna differentiate here is sometimes the last known well is not the same as the onset of symptoms. So 
they could say, well, I woke up this morning and now I notice I have this facial droop and my left arm is weak. Well, they woke up. So that's not that we don't know when it was, when it started. It could have started at 3 a.m., could have started at midnight, could have started at 10 o'clock, but they went to bed at nine o'clock last night and they were good. So nine o'clock last night was their last known well. And if it's four, five o'clock in the morning, they're still within that 24 hours. So you'd want to get them to us because we're going to look, work them up to see if they can have a mechanical thrombectomy. So that's really important for that part. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have seen these stickers. We had them in our EMS lounge and um, we've restocked them, but we don't really see them come back. So we can get them for you if you're interested. However, this information can actually be on your short form and on the information that you fill out electronically, where you put in the patient's last known well, their contact name, the person to contact for them, and the phone number. It's really important. We spend a lot of time trying to find their family members and the phone numbers um, so we can nail down the last known well, their medications, their history. So we need your help with this. So this is what you guys are doing in the field. This is the Cincinnati Prescale. That's the FAST that you guys are all aware of. But what happens next? Because we know that 72% probability of a stroke if this is positive. So if this is, if Cincinnati is positive, what's your next step? Next step is going to be doing the LAMB score. So facial droop, arm drift, grip strength. The reason we do the LAMB score is a score is a score of four or greater is a high probability of a large vessel occlusion. That large vessel occlusion is what we can remove the clot from in a, a mechanical thrombectomy. So if your patient is a LAMB score of four or greater and is less than 22 hours from the last known well, we want you to call the base station so we can figure out where they should go. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more about the new, the new policy that's in place for this, but these patients would still be a priority one if they have stroke symptoms within 24 hours. So when you see this patient, you're going to get the finger stick. Now this comes actually from your EMS Comar um, regulations. You're going to get their finger stick because we always get a finger stick. If it's less than 70, you're going to treat. At the hospital, if their blood sugar is less than 50, or greater than 400, we can't give TPA. We can treat and then give TPA, but we don't give TPA because less than 50 could be a mimic and greater than 400 puts them high risk for um, a bleed. So we really don't wanna treat them. We wanna treat them and then consider TPA. Um, your regulations say to start an IV access with lactate ringers. If they're hypotensive, you wanna call in and see what, what guidance the, the ED doctor wants to give you. Um, if you're able to get blood samples, great. I know that's kind of a, a hard part that I've, we've heard when we've given this lecture in the past that it's, there's really time constraints to get that done. So we understand that. Really important, if they are hypertensive, we do not want you to treat the hypertension for a couple of reasons. One, you want to keep their blood pressure in a certain parameter if they're having a bleed. We don't want it to go too high. We don't want it to go too low. So just kind of keep it there. Two, if they are having an active stroke, we don't want their blood pressure too low because they are used to having a certain level of perfusion in their brain. And if we drop their pressure down too low, they're not going to get enough blood flow to their brain. So we just want you to let it go. Now, if it's super high, like 200 over 100 or something, certainly call that in when you call in your, your alert to the, the box. But um, we don't anticipate treating the blood pressure in the field. You want to keep their head a bed of 30 degrees. So once again, one of the things that are important, last known well for the base station consult. Priority one for all stroke patients with stroke symptoms within 24 hours. Get their lambs and their Cincinnati. And you wanna say that this is a stroke alert because when you say it's a stroke alert, the people on the other end are like, oh, we need to get our team together and get ready to, to, to rock and roll when you get here. So we know what that means. So that, so when you call us, we have what's called the CERT team, the critical emergency room team. And so we send that into action. And sometimes, because when I review this, the charts, based on your reports, they send out the first CERT sprain attack alert so people in the hospital know that this patient's coming in and that we're going to have to clear the CT table. And there's going to be brain attack labs coming down the lab. So everyone is on point, ready to treat this patient. All right. So now the stroke patient in the ED. So when you bring them in or when they come in through the door, either way, whether we, they walk in or they come in by EMS from you guys, we determine was, has it been less than four and a half hours or greater than four hours, half hours that they were last known well. So it, at St. Joe's, we actually have two different order sets based on that. 
But really the reason we do it is if it's less than four and a half hours, they can get TPA. So the entire team, EMS, the patient, the CERT team members are all gonna go to the EDCT suite. So we can get all the information together. We're gonna weigh them, we're gonna move on. Um, if it's greater than four and a half hours and less than 22, we're still gonna treat them like this is an emergency. We're gonna get that brain attack CT done because we wanna make sure we don't have a brain bleed going on and if there's a potential for treating them. So the data, so what things do we look for? So the first thing we do is we're gonna get that CT scan because if there's blood on that CT scan, we're not given TPA. And then we have to go different parameters for blood pressure, different treatment mechanisms. Um, if there's no blood on the CT, then we think, can they get TPA or can we, do we send them downtown to one of the other hospitals for a, a mechanical thrombectomy? So whole team goes through them, including you guys. We look at their inclusion exclusion criteria. That's the part where we need to, did they just take Eliquis? Do they have a history of bleeding? Do they have a recent GI bleed? All those things are things we're figuring out at this point. The weight is something you guys may have seen if you've been to St. Joe's. We have these scales. You can see right here, they're flipped down. That actually flips up when they're not in use. We're gonna put the EMS stretcher on here with the patient on. We weigh them and then we do we put the patient on the CT scanner and then we weigh your stretcher again and figure out, calculate the weight. Because TPA is a weight-based drug, we cannot do an estimate. We need to have the actual weight when we do the, comp, the um, calculations. This is that um, sticker again, just showing the kind of information we need. Um, we want you to find out when you're doing your real quick workup on the patient on site with the um, family, you know, have they had surgery, all those things we've talked about because we want to make sure we have all the knowledge we need before we give them this drug that you know can save them a lifetime of disability, but in the wrong setting can cause some great harm too. So we want to make sure we have everything we know. We have everything we need. So the labs that are important, like we talked about, is the glucose. We want the glucose right away. We're going to test that again when they come into the hospital. We check their finger stick. Um, the platelet count, the coag times. So here's the thing with those. If the patient is on um, blood thinners, like Coumadin, we're going to wait for that INR to come back before we make any decision about giving TPA. Because if their INR is greater than 1.7, we can't give TPA because it's too high risk of a bleed. If it's less than 1.7, that means they're not therapeutic. And if they have no other reason, we could actually give TPA because if they don't have a therapeutic range, obviously their anticoagulation is not effective. Um, the platelet count, if it comes back low, we can stop what we're doing and not give the TPA, but we don't hold TPA for that. So we need two lines. So if you've gotten one line in, that's great. We're gonna add another one because we need to have two bore, large bore IVs so we can have one for TPA and have the additional one for blood pressure management if need be. Um, okay, these are the tools that you'll see our ED providers using. On the left, this is the NIH stroke scale. So you guys do the LAMP score in the Cincinnati. Our providers do this whole score. Um, you can have a maximum score. It says 42 if you add all the numbers up, but we know that's not mathematically possible because they can't, just the way there's caveats in here. Um, but if their score is 16 or greater, we know that's a pretty severe stroke and a severe disability probability. If it's less than six, they will probably have a very good recovery. Um, and if it's greater than six, that's when we look to see if they need to have that clot removed um, from a thrombectomy. So one of the things we use to figure out whether they can have a thrombectomy is we do a CTA. So a CTA is the CT scan and then they repeat it with the dye load. Um, and we're looking at the blood vessels of the brain because we wanna see um, if there's an actual clot. So if you can see here, here's a clot. And then you can see where there's not any extra um, blood vessels here compared to this side over here. Um, so we do this because we want, if there's a clot that we can retrieve, we're looking for that. So if it's less than six hours, we just do the CTA. If it's greater than six hours, we do the CTP, uh, which is the perfusion study. And I have a picture of that later on in the slides. Does anybody have any questions up to now? Okay. Just interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, okay, so once we get into that CT scan, if it's negative, so we can see right away in the CAT scan control room if there's a bleed, if we don't see that there's an obvious bleed. Um, and we've done the NIH and we say, yes, this person doesn't have a bleed. They do have stroke um, symptoms going on. 
Our labs are pending, but we feel pretty good. We would go through the inclusion exclusion list. Um, do they need endovascular? We're talking about that. We're doing all these things. ED providers figuring out all this stuff, hopefully within 10 to 15 minutes, because we want to move really quick on this. So this is about the drugs that we have. So we know that currently TPA or Alteplase is the only FDA approved drug for the treatment of stroke. So that's considered the gold standard. Um, TPA has, the studies were done up to three hours. So that is the gold standard for three hours. In the three to four and a half hour window, which we do give it in, that's that extended window and we look at the criteria. Um, they've never done a study for that because they really don't want to make a patient wait. That wouldn't be probably correct. Um, there is another dr drug coming out com called Tenecteplase, and it's in trials right now. It's being used in some places, and it's actually going to be a trial in the University of Maryland system in the future, um, but they're still working on all the logistics for that. Um, and the, the way Tenecteplase is thought that would be great is it, one, it's a quicker thing. You give a shot, and then you move, you give the injection, and you move on. So it's not give a bolus and then give the infusion over 45 minutes. So they're thinking that in the future, it'll be like people that are need to transfer. So um, more to come on that. But our door to needle goal, so from the time they walk into the door with you until we get that needle in their arm is 45 minutes. American Heart wants us to get under 30. So um, the quicker we all hustle, the better we get. And if you see this pink pin here, some of you I know have it. Um, this is her EMS nurses, whoever, who was on the team for a patient who got their TPA in under 45 minutes, they get the pink pin. So we're talking about that plumbing again. We're trying to save the at-risk tissues. Here's another picture of it. This is the, the stroke itself. That's the clot. The dead tissue is the core. This is the penumbra we're trying to save. The zero to three is that window that's been approved through the FDA trial. The three to four and a half is the extended at window when we go through the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, and we also know a lot of people don't get in, in the hospital in time to get the TPA but they may still be candidates for endovascular. So we always wanna make sure we look at them for both of those. So endovascular is where they put actually the stent retrieval, it goes in, it goes past the clot and then they pull it out. Um, and sometimes it takes several passes. And, and now they're actually, um, there's research about whether they're gonna put them under or keep them in a twilight. They do use twilights, so the patient's actually awake when they do this. Um, but they're starting to do some general anesthesia as well um, to get that clot out. So this is the other one I was talking to you about. This is CT perfusion. So it, rapid is what it's called. Um, and these are for, this is for the patients that have had, um, it's, they have a large vessel occlusion. So we know that their NIH is six or greater. Their LAM score is four or greater but they're beyond the six hours. So this was the last two, like I think 2019 was when this opened up. Um, there were two more trials called Dawn and Perfuse. And what they did is they said, can we take that clot out after six hours? Because the first of the trials when they did the clot retrieval, it was to six hours and this expands it to the 24. So when you look at this, it's usually the difference between the core, which is the pink and the green, which is the penumbra. And if there's enough of a difference, they consider it safe. So if the core is up to 70 and there's enough of a mismatch, then they know that they can go in and get that clot out in that extended window. Now, if the core and the number are about equal, that means that extended time has caused more damage. Because we know that some people's strokes grow quicker than others. So this is for the people who have a stroke, they don't get to the hospital right away, but they have a slow growing stroke, so they still have hope. And if we have time, I'll show you that video at the end. So that was our success story. So the new protocol I wanted to talk to you about, um, there's two. This one was actually in 2018. That was talking about having that contact information. So um, that you should already be aware of. The next one is, this was a trial. So there was originally a bypass trial in the county, in the city and in the county, and now it's been adopted. So what this means is if the patient is, has stroke symptoms within 24 hours and they are within 30 minutes of a comprehensive stroke center or Sinai, which is that um, mechanical scarabectomy capable center, then you need to consult with them and transport the patient to that center. The reason being is they have found that if we get them quicker to the thrombectomy site, 
they get the clot out quicker and the patients do well. Um, so once again, if their score is four or greater in the LAMS and they're within 30 minutes of ground transport, not helicopter, but ground transport, you want to do your, your consult with the comprehensive or the mechanical thrombectomy capable center. So Hopkins, Bayview, um, University of Maryland, or Sinai, just to see if they want to bring, come there because that would be the most appropriate location to take that patient. If you bring them to us or you call us first, we're going to say, hey, did you consider going to a comprehensive center? And because our nurses are trained to ask, our providers are trained to ask that. Um, and sometimes what happens, we've had this happen before too, with a LAMP score was a two, you bring them to us and then their stroke gets worse and we end up transferring them anyway. So that does happen. But we're trying to do this to see if we can get them to the right place at the right time quicker. So our goal from the time they get to our door to the time they get down to the comprehensive center is 90 minutes. So when you think about all the things we have to do in 90 minutes and get transportation lined up again, that's really quick. Um, the arrival to destination, so once they get there, the decision is 15 minutes. And then by the time they get to on site, they want to get that cloud out in 60 minutes. That's pretty quick. Everyone's moving very quickly. If you look here, this is actually one of our patients. Um, this is where there was an occlusion. And this is after they did the pass and got the clot out. So you can see how much, see there's nothing here and how much they improved that person's um, perfusion. So that was a very successful patient. And what happens next? So once they come to us, if we give them TPA, they're gonna to go to the ICU or we have those patients we call drip and ship. So they're the ones we give TPA to, but they can still have endovascular and we'll send them downtown if need be. Um, or if we don't give them TPA, and they're not going to endovascular. Um, they can go to ICU if it's a big enough stroke where they have other comorbidities, or they can go to our stroke telemetry unit, or we can transfer them if they're a huge stroke and we're worried about um, malignant edema. So those are where all the places these patients will go. So once again, we'll just talk about these chain of survival. Detection is the early recognition by the bystander, the patient, early activation is the dispatch, delivery is you guys bringing them in and giving us the communication of the last known well and the contact person. Um, door is the primary stroke center, that would be us, or the comprehensive. Data, triage, last known well, history, medication. Decision is our brain attack team works together with you to decide what's the next plan for this patient. The drug is the Alta Place, also known as TPA. Um, and the disposition is whether we're going to keep them or transfer them. So a couple cases of stroke that the state wants us to be aware that we kind of communicate. Um, but you know, we don't think about this too often, but women that have just had babies and women that are pregnant can have strokes. Part of it's because of the hypercoagulation of their bloodstream. Um, so they are susceptible to strokes. You want to be alert to stroke symptoms in that patient population. And kids too can have strokes. Um, you know, infections can cause strokes for them, birth disorders can cause strokes for them, or brain injury, blood disorders. So those patients for the pediatric, you're going to call the pediatric base station, and I believe they're always going to go to Hopkins Bayview or Hopkins. So this is my contact information and Amy's contact information. And I think I finished, oh, I talked really fast. I finished in 30 minutes. <laughs> I told you I can talk fast. Um, so if you guys ever have any questions, you can always email Amy and I. Um, you can give us a call. You can say hello when you stop by. Um, any questions? Okay, well, since I stopped early, Sean, I'm gonna show that video if that's okay with you. Yes, of course. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so I get up my other one. Um, Here where I put it up oh, here. This Karen. Yeah. Before you, uh, there's a couple questions. Okay. That, um, do you know what's causing the rise in strokes with pregnant women? Um, I don't know if there's been a rise per se. I haven't seen any statistics about rise. I think there's more of a recognition that it's actually happening. I don't think people really realize that there was a stroke. There were strokes possible in that population. And is there any change in the stroke level with COVID? So that's actually very interesting because originally um, I would say no, we had a decrease, right? Because we had people just not coming to the hospital for strokes and heart attacks. Um, there has been some patients that have been linked with stroke, especially up in New York City. There were some studies that came out um, where there were strokes um, 
at, at with COVID patients and they actually showed up with symptoms of stroke before COVID and there were actually some with the opposite as well. Um, there is some thought that that's because their D-dimer, which is a, a measurement of them, they have a hypercoagulable state, which makes them prone to DVTs, um, pulmonary emboli and stroke. So we are seeing that and we're seeing that a little more. We see that actually with these patients that are sick for longer, um, not the ones that come in right away, but the ones that have been sick for a while. I will say our population really was down for a while though, because we just weren't having people in. Then we had kind of a research. And so when COVID went down for a little bit, our stroke patients came up. It's kind of like they said, oh yeah, now it's safe to come back in and they're coming back. So it's kind of been all over the place, but overall it's been a drop. Any other questions? Karen, right, I see a question um, that says, if you take a patient at St. Joe's, determine that the patient needs to go to another stroke center, can the EMS crew that brought the patient to St. Joe also transport the patient to the comprehensive center? Oh, you that's a very good question. Turn them right around or you guys do stuff. Okay, so here's the deal with that because we actually had that happen recently um, that we thought there was a bed, not a bed and transportation was a mess and, you know, because there's not a whole lot of crews available. So if the patient does not give TPA, we have got, we have talked to Dr. Bitberg and that they are allowed to transport the patient. If you guys are still there, you can transfer them to the next level if they don't have TPA. And there's no reason that they would need a nurse on board with them. Um, we're still working on the logistics of that um, because even for, if we use express care, because which is who we normally use because we transfer to the University of Maryland a lot, they wouldn't even need a nurse crew if they're not on, on any drips. So that's, that's the key. So yes, you, you can. Um, most likely you're probably going to want your, your supervisor's permission and we would make sure we helped with that. That's a great question though. Hey, you guys, so don't forget to sign in. Ashley put a sign-in sheet. Um, yeah, the link for the sign-in. I'm going to pull up that video. You can use the last question. So I just want to remember to show you this. That's not what I wanted to show. Where is it? There it is. All right. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Second, and I'll be 86. Got to know I had a stroke until it was all over with. The morning of July the 3rd, um, I was home and she was home with my brother. My brother lives with her. She had gone into the bathroom and she fell. And she had asked my brother to help her, not realizing that she had even had a stroke. So my brother listened to her talk and right away her speech was very garbled. I told my brother, I said, call 911 um, and see if they can take her to St. Joe's. My name is Ben Van Landingham. I'm one of the attending emergency doctors at St. Joe's Emergency Room. I was on duty at 7 in the morning when Mrs. Coos came in. This case was fairly easy from a diagnostic point of view because the medics were able to recognize appropriately as soon as they saw her that it looked like she was having a stroke. In fact, her family figured as much as well. And so we have a system uh, alerting us and talking ahead of time to, to make us aware that they're bringing in somebody who appeared to be so, so when she arrived, we have a setup in our hospital where we, where we meet uh, the patient and the ambulance crew as soon as they arrive before they even go into a room. And we start talking uh, right then and there. And so I accompanied Mrs. Coops straight to the CAT scan suite as we talked and as I began to examine her. One sec, they got me into the emergency room. They were like right on top of things, you know, taking care of me. I remember the doctor coming in asking me where I was at and how I felt. And what day of the month was it and all that. And I knew all that. When she arrived at seven in the morning, the last known well time was one in the morning. That's when we were able to say she was fine then. And then she recalled falling on the ground and uh, was able to tell me that she didn't hurt herself and didn't have any pain, but we knew that she was out of the window for the intravenous medication. 
what we have now, which is the newest uh, a tool, it, it is, is the opportunity for the right patient uh, to be referred down to the University Medical Center for this advanced interventional therapy. The only major treatment option that she had was uh, interventional therapy in the form of trying to uh, put a catheter up in the brain and uh, pull out the clot. And so they called the University of Maryland Medical Center uh, promptly and reached a member of our stroke team. Uh, and then she was uh, transferred to University of Maryland Medical Center and uh, was uh, treated. Well, once the patient arrived, we worked closely with Dr. Chetavede and his stroke neurology team to ensure that the patient's imaging suggested that the benefit to risk ratio of the procedure was such that the chance of the patient benefiting was high enough that we should take her to the angio suite to try to reopen the blocked vessel. So on the left of the screen, we have the pretreatment imaging. It's a side view of the brain while we're injecting contrast in the main carotid artery. And we can see that there's a large area that's not receiving direct or forward blood flow in this region. This should all be filled with black blood vessels. And we can see that there's none here because of a blockage down low at the base of the brain. After our treatment, after we were successful removing the clot, in the same sort of side view, we can see that this whole area is now filled with these dark blood vessels. We can actually begin to see some of the contrast going out because um, it follows the pathway of the blood actually into the tissue. So you can actually see this, this sort of hazy grayness on, the, on this image on the right is actually an indication that we restored the blood flow to that area of the brain that was affected by the stroke. When she presented with a, a stroke of this severity, uh, to be discharged within three days is uh, amazing. And uh, I think that is a testament to the fact that uh, St. Joseph Hospital uh, got her to University of Maryland very quickly and uh, Dr. Miller was able to treat her uh, quickly as well. So all of those factors really uh, ensured her uh, best chance for recovery. It was amazing how everybody just worked together because time was a real issue with getting this clot out. I didn't expect to see her today, but we had a chance to meet. And the last time I saw her was on July 3rd in the emergency department. And what a joy to see her looking so well on her feet, walking without a cane. Her daughter, Lisa, who had been at St. Joe's emergency with me, uh, was there that morning. And I told them that to see her doing so well now, three months later, is, is, is exactly what we need to get through every long, hard day. And this outcome is inspiring. And, and it makes everything we do worthwhile. I just give God all the credit because if it wasn't for the Lord, I, I wouldn't be here. And I think he was really looking out for me. So I just wanted to share that because that, that actually is using that new technology, that, that CT perfusion. And that was a patient that got to us within the time frame. Um, she's greater than six hours, less than 22. And but she looks amazing. No. So thank you for all you do to help these patients get where they need to be. Yeah, I just also just want to comment also, you know, just the diversity in which we see these situations, right? I've been on a number of calls over the years, one not long ago where it was in a, a senior living community and it was coded as a fall, right? So the BLS crew and the providers, as soon as they approached the patient, they knew right away, right? He was dysarthric. He was very weak on one side. He didn't remember what was going on and they appropriately upgraded and said, yeah, this is a stroke. So that's, was, uh, yeah, that they, they come in, in many different ways, right? How they show up. I, I think that's absolutely correct. I'm sure Amy, you've seen that as well. We see people come in that weren't stroke calls initially and because you people write the EMS, it's right there. You identify that and you get them the help they need. So. We couldn't do it if you didn't bring them to us. That's awesome. The other sick calls, right? So patients all of a sudden with, you know, vomiting out of nowhere. It's like, why would somebody be projectile vomiting, right? That's it's such a red flag that they're having a posterior stroke. Yeah, we've had bystanders call where they, someone was at a gas station, all of a sudden they seem confused. And so they just confused altered mental status. And sure enough, that's when strokes and they get upgraded and you guys bring them in. So you guys caught a lot of good catches. Any guidance for providers? I hear a lot of um, back and forth about, you know, the issue of patients who have dizziness, right? And ever since now, 
that you know when they brought, expanded the criteria to include posterior symptoms, now all of a sudden providers feel you know that it's not always warranted to label a dizziness patient as a level one, right, priority one stroke alert. Right. Sometimes they even yeah, hear yeah, it from the hospital. That. So as a stroke coordinator, I want it to be a priority one stroke alert. And here's why, because those patients, if their only symptom is dizziness and they don't have a straight gait, their gait's unsteady. And then especially if they have the vomiting, if their symptoms are posterior, I would rather work them up than not. Because if, if it's not a stroke, okay, fine. But if it is a stroke, you want a person to have this unsteady gait and ataxia where they can't drive a car or take care of their grandchildren ever again. So I would want to work err on the side of caution and work them up and bring them in. Right. It's not the weak, lightheaded, right, patient. It's the, right. the patient with dizziness who can't keep their balance, who has, you know, visual or, or slurred vision or slurred speech. Or, right. Right. And it's the sudden. It's not like they've been dizzy for two weeks or a week or it comes and, you know, it's. Right. Malady, okay. fevers, not that. Right. Yeah. Uh, there was a question in here about, um, why do you want EMS providers in the imaging room for the CTA? So the reason we want you in there, sometimes we still have questions. And two, if we have to unload the patient from the stretcher to the ED stretcher and then go to the imaging room, it takes a lot of time. So you can ask Amy because she's on these calls all the time at the bedside. We just, we put them up, we take your stretcher, we weigh them, then we put them there. And then it kind of gives you guys the end of the story too. What's happening? You know, our, is this, and we worked really hard to get this patient to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to give him TPA or what's the deal? And we do still ask questions afterwards. So, do you have anything to add to that, Amy? Amy, you're on mute. I'm trying. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it just saves a lot of time to take the EMS stretcher right from right into the CAT scan instead of unloading on a stretcher. It just saves minutes. And that's what we're just trying to cut our times back to make the best um, opportunity for the patients. So that's the only reason. And we usually, it's usually a whole discussion. We do all the discussion and the doctors in the CT room, everyone's in there. And there's a question, what about the inverted vision only? I don't know, SL, what exactly that means, inverted vision only? Like loss of vision? So if you, if you have like a vision loss, which we would call hemianopia, where if you think of your eye, you split into four quadrants and you can't see anything out of this side, out of both eyes, that's a stroke symptom. So we would want that patient to come in. Now, blurred vision could be a lot of things. That could be a stroke symptom too. It could be a lot of things. So basically, if you think there's any chance this patient's had a stroke, bring them in. We'd rather work them up and it'd be like, no, you know, and we have that happen. They said, I know someone who had a stroke and the only sign was that he saw everything upside down. I have not heard of that before. Uh, interesting. I have not heard that either. I mean, you never know. I mean, I, you know, it's probably the location of the brain. It's, it's the location where it is. And I couldn't tell you which location would give it upset. I want to say it would be the back frontal lobe in the visual fields um, as opposed to the occipital, but I that's merely a, a guess. I'm going to have to look into that. I don't know that one. Well, I don't see anything else in the chat. I'm going to hang on if there's anything else for the sign-ins, for the CMEs, if there are any issues. But Karen and Amy, thank you so much for all that you guys have been doing over the years, for educating our providers, and for your dedicated care of these vulnerable, vulnerable patients. So thank you for everything you guys do. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. You guys have a great night. Bye. Thanks for having us.